Hi, everybody, and welcome to the second uh, edition of our webinar series celebrating the plant cell focus issue on RNA biology. This issue uh, is the June 2023 issue, um, and it was edited by Mark, Mike Axtell, Andrea Barta, Shimi Chen, Nan Eckert, Brian Gregory, Hongwei Gu, Pablo Manavia, Blake Myers, and Becky Mosher, who will be our host today. We have three speakers whose work appears in the focus issue, and our moderator is Nora Flynn, who is an assistant features editor for the journal. Uh, this video will be posted to YouTube, like all of our webinars, within a few days after the broadcast. And we'd like to make a special thank you to ASPB member uh, attendees um, because this series is supported by ASPB membership dues. If you're interested in becoming a member, if you use the code PRESENTS10, you'll get 10% off your membership dues. <clears throat> if you have any technical problems, feel free to email me, mwilliams at ASPB.org. If you, oh, please put your questions into the Q&A box and Nora will select some and read them aloud. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Becky who will tell us a bit more about the focus issue. Thank you, Mary. Let me get my um, screen sharing running. There it is. All right, I hope you all can see that. Um, I, it's my job to kind of introduce this focus issue to you. Hopefully some of you actually attended the first webinar that went through this, but it's a really exciting issue focused on RNA biology. We've got a number of reviews um, as well as research focused articles. And I just wanna take a minute to maybe explain what the editorial board was thinking about with this. And we're all quite familiar with the central dogma, right? There it is. Um, DNA encodes RNA, which encodes protein, and I always like to include this is what is functional in the cell. And I think we're also familiar with this, but it really focuses on just one limited role of RNA. You know, this is this kind of passes of information is what mRNA does. Um, and we all know mRNA is the most boring form of RNA. Um, and so RNA ends up being kind of limited in this view. So I just want to point out the many other things that RNA does within molecular biology. So for example, we know that it's central to the processes of transcription and translation. It's also um, required for DNA replication, right? RNA primes that process. Um, and RNA itself, you don't even need DNA. RNA can encode information and reverse transcribe to create DNA. So really we could have put RNA at the beginning of this process. So these are some of the kind of um, housekeeping, really central molecular biology roles of RNA. But we also now know that RNA plays incredible regulatory roles, right? MicroRNAs can regulate mRNA. Um, other types of small RNAs and non-coding RNAs can modify DNA. Um, they play central roles in regulating transcription. I could have drawn an arrow there as well. And RNA also directly contributes to function by being enzymatic, like ribozymes. So I threw this together just earlier today. I may have forgotten your favorite kind of non-canonical role of RNA, but I just wanted to, to take a moment to highlight how central RNA is in molecular biology, how important it is in molecular biology and in the functioning of cells. And so we thought it would be important and timely to have an issue focused on all of the biology surrounding RNA, not just this concept of it being a messenger. So to go through the, um, this focus issue a little bit. Um, some of there's a, a number of really really great review articles. Um, I want to point out in particular this first one by Pablo Manavea that um, is one of these vignette style reviews. So there's twelve small stories about really compelling open questions um, in plant RNA biology, um, interesting recent discoveries, and the questions that still remain to be answered. So if you want an overview, um, that's where you should begin. And then other more focused reviews we have, one by Sally Asman, looking at the structure of RNA and how um, it, it can take many different forms to carry out different functions in the cell. We also have a review by Sebastian Marquardt about crosstalk between transcription and RNA maturation. 
Okay, so the co-transcriptional processing of RNA. Um, a review here by Julieta Mateo and Dorothy Steger um, discussing how kind of we've had new advancements to study RNA binding proteins um, to really look at those proteins that are associated with RNAs and what they might be doing. A review by um, Ian Small on RNA binding proteins, uh, as well as um, all of really RNA maturation and processing in organelles, which is of course another really interesting aspect of plant biology that there are multiple genomes, each of which create RNA and have functions for RNA. Um, we also have a review about alternative splicing, but um, uh, as I knew I was going to get it wrong. Esakil Patrio. Um, so alternative splicing, of course, again, central co-transcriptional regulatory mechanism that involves a lot of RNA. Um, a review on non-coding RNAs um, by Kyle Palos and colleagues. Again, this is a, a very, um, an area where we've had tremendous recent advancements in the last several years, including the ability to catalog a lot of long non-coding RNAs. A review uh, by myself and Cecilia Chow, looking at how small RNAs um, alter DNA um, and particular roles in, for that during plant reproduction and the transmission of DNA from one generation to the next. Um, and two last reviews, one by Will Pearl and colleagues, um, looking at the modification of mRNAs, so kind of epigenetic sometimes modifications, which again, a very, um, timely review as this is an area with a lot of ongoing research. And then finally, a review by Michelle Heaney and um, Margaret Frank on mobile RNAs. The idea that those functions I outlined, um, particularly the transfer of information, don't just happen within a cell, but can happen from cell to cell, um, which I think is also a really interesting frontier. So those are the review articles in the focus issue. We also have a number of research articles that I'm not going to go through um, and take up time with right now, because these three here in purple, you're going to hear about in the focus issue, or sorry, you're going to hear about in the webinar um, just in, in a few moments. And three of the other reports were covered in the first webinar, which you can access online. I'm sure Mary will include a link to that. So if you weren't attending that, you can watch it, watch the recording of it. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what this focus issue was about, gets you excited to hear um, some of the interesting RNA biology we'll hear in just a moment. Um, my last task is to introduce our moderator, who is Nora Flynn. Nora is a PhD candidate in Shumei Chen's lab at um, UC Riverside, and she's looking at plastid gene expression and working at ways that we can understand that better. We can basically apply sequencing technologies um, and new visu visualization approaches to understand uh, plastid transcripts. And I think something that's really interesting is she's a fellowship to look at doing single plastid RNA sequencing. Um, so understanding perhaps the population of plastids as their individuals rather than as a, an amalgam. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to you, Nora. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and uh, welcome again to everybody who is attending this uh, RNA biology webinar. I'm very excited to be moderating um, for three great uh, talks today. And as we're listening to these talks, uh, just a reminder that there is a Q&A button where you can share your questions during the talk um, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Lisha Shen. So Lisha Shen received her BS degree uh, from Shanghai Zhao Chong University in China in 2006, and her PhD degree from the National University of Singapore in 2010. She joined Tem Temasek Life Sciences Laboratory as a research fellow in 2011, and established her independent research group in 2018. Her major uh, research interest is in RNA modifications in plant development. And so with that, I'll go ahead and hand over the screen to Leisha. I'm very excited uh, to hear your talk today. Okay, uh, th thank you, Nora, for the nice introduction. And thank you for ha having me here. So I will start my uh, share start to share my screen. Uh, 
I hope every, everyone can see my screen and uh, hear me clearly. Um, and, uh, uh, thank you all for joining this webinar. And I will share my story on the functional interdependence of M6A mesotransverse complex subunits in Arabidopsis. So the post-transcriptional chemical modifications to RNAs are collectively termed the epitranscriptome. Epitranscriptome is the functional relevant change to the transcriptome that do not involve a change in the RNA sequence. Epitranscriptome includes all the chemical modifications to the transcriptome within a cell and the enzymes or proteins that install, removal, uh, remove, or integrate the modifications. Any modifications are common biological processes in most, in most eukaryotic cells. And currently there are over 170 different chemical modifications has been found. In plants, the messengers are known to have several RNA modifications, including the CAT modifications and several internal modifications, including the M6A modification, M1A, M5C, and the pseudo-uridine modifications. Among all these internal modifications, M6A is the most abundant. M6A is uh, short for the N6 adenosine, and it refers to the methylation of adenosine at the N6 position. And it is conserved in many species, such as uh, yeast, flies, mammals, and plants. It is a reversible modification, and its, it's dynamics requires a uh, conserved, uh, evolutionarily conserved M6A writers, erasers, and readers for the deposition, removal, and interpretation. The deposition of M6A is catalyzed by a multi-component M6A rather complex, or also called the M6A mesotransferase complex. In the model plant Arab Arabidopsis saliana, the multi-component rather complex contains two mesotransferases called MTA and MTB. MTA and MTB form the MAC subcomplex, which constitutes the catalytic core of this complex. And this m 6 rather complex also contains several accessory subunits, including FIP37, VRR, HiKai, and HIZ2. So this accessory complex forms the MACOM subcomplex. Among all these known components, MTA, MTB, VRR, and FIP37 are essential for the embryo development as they are non-mutants or embryo lethal. And these four proteins are indispensable for the M6A methylation. And however, HiKai plays a less prominent, prominent role and it is required for the full M6A methylation. Although the components in this complex is known, the precise function of each component is unknown. And how this component affect each other to fulfill the function of M6 rather complex as a whole it is, is unknown. And, and in particularly, whether these accessory subunits, such as FIP37, VRR, and HiKai, um, whether they affect the function of M6 methyltransferases remain unclear. So uh, uh, in, in my study to to study the potential regulation occurring among these M6C component genes, we first generated all the relevant reduction or function or loss function mutants of this known M6C writers. So we use the artificial microarray, artificial microarrays to knock down the expression of MTA or VIR. And while we use the, the embryo specific promoters of ABS3 or LAC1 to drive the expression of MTB or FIP37 in the embryo developmental stage to complement their embryo lethal phenotype. And we also generated the high kai mutant by CRISPR-Cas9. So the resulting uh, MTB and the FIP37 mutants uh, shows the strikingly large fruit apex region, as you can clearly see in the enlarged photos. And MTA and MTB knockdown lines, they show abnormal leaf shape and also grows along the leaf margins at, at the early stage. And it also shows the overproliferated shoots at epicomer stem at the later developmental stage. In contrast, the high-kai mutants do not show obvious uh, growth defect. 
So these phenotypes are in line with the total M6 levels. In, in the mutants of MTA, MTB, CYP37, and VRR, the total M6 levels was greatly reduced and compared to the wild type plants. And however, in the high kind mutants, the total M6 level is slightly reduced. So I, I then analyzed the analyze the expression levels of these five M6A writer genes in their mutants. Expression of these genes are significantly reduced in their own respective mutants, but do not show great change in other mutants. So this result suggests that these M6A writer genes do not greatly affect each other at the transcriptional level. Uh, then I proceeded to examine the potential regulation at the post-transcriptional level, mainly through examining the protein expression and localization pattern of the specific promoter, uh, of a, a specific component in the mutants of other components using the functional transgenic lines or specific antibodies. Firstly, I generated the MTAGFP in wild type and in the MTB mutant backgrounds. MTAGFP was clearly detected in the uh, wild type Columbia background, but its abundance was dramatically decreased in the MTB mutants. So I further examined the subcellular localization of MTA. So in the uh, wild type background, MTAGFP was localized in the nuclear, uh, nuclear, nuclear plasma, uh, but it's absent from the nucleolus. Mm, uh, in the MTB mutant background, the fluorescence intensity of MTAGFP was greatly reduced, but the localization pattern se uh, seems to be similar to the wild type plants. Next, I examined the, the protein abundance of MTB in the wild type and MTA knockdown lines. So, uh, the protein abundance of, of MTB for uh, HA was significantly reduced in the MTA knockdown lines. And the, moreover, uh, MTB GFP protein was localized in both the nucleus and in the cytoplasm in cytoplasma in MTA knockdown lines, which is different from its localization pattern in the nuclear plasm, nuclear in the nucleus in the wild in the wild type plants. So this result suggests that MTA is also required for the nuclear localization of MTB protein. So together, this, this result suggests that uh, MTA and MTB mutually affect each other at the protein level. Moving forward, I examined the protein abundance of M MTA and MTB in FIP37 mutants. Surprisingly, I observed that the abundance of both the total and the nuclear MTA protein was significantly decreased in FIP37 mutants, highlighting the important role of in MTA protein accumulation. So consist, uh, consistently, the MTA uh, GFP protein was greatly reduced uh, in FIP37. Uh, interestingly, in contrast to, to its uh, nu uh, nuclear plasma localization pattern in the wild type plants, in FIP37 mutants, MTA GFP protein was localized throughout the, throughout the nucleus. So to examine whether FIP37 maintains the MTA protein abundance through affecting the stability, I use the MG132, which is a 20, uh, 26S proteasome inhibitor to, to treat the ceilings. So MG132 treatment has no obvious effect on the protein level of MTA protein in the wild type background. In contrast to the, in the FIP37 mutant backgrounds, MG132 treatment increased the MTA protein levels. So this result indicates that FIP37 is re required to stabilize, stabilize MTA. Similar to MTA, uh, MTB4HA protein abundance was greatly reduced in the FIP37 mutants, indicating the important role of FIP37 in maintaining MTB protein accumulation. And uh, uh, while in the wild type plants, the MTB GLP was localized in the uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear plasma. Uh, in FIP37 mutants, it, the MTB GLP was distributed throughout the nucleus, and it could also be weakly detected in the cytoplasm. 
Mm. So this, uh, this result suggests the role of FIP37 in maintaining both the protein level and the protein localization of MTB protein. So similarly, the MG132 treatment increased the MTB protein level in FIP37 FIP mucin background, but not in the wild type background, suggesting that, MTB, uh, suggesting that the FIP37 also stabilized MTB protein. So moving on to study whether VRR plays a similar role as FIP37 in influencing the MTA and MTB uh, at the post-transcriptional level, I examined the protein levels of MTA and MTB in VRR knockdown lines. Uh, we can see from here that the MTA protein was easily detected in the wild type, but this abundance is dramatically decreased in VRR knockdown. Mutant, suggesting an essential role for VRR in maintaining the protein abundance of MTA. So further confocal analysis revealed that there was no obvious change in the subcellular localization pattern of MTA GLP in the VR knockdown lines. And similarly, the um, there is a there there was a dramatic decrease of protein abundance of MTB protein in the VRR knockdown lines. And while the MTB GFP protein localization was not altered in the VR knockdown lines. And since HICAI has been consistently identified, identified as a component of the M60 record complex, I then also examined whether HICAI um, affects the protein abundance of MTA and MTB. And however, the result uh, suggests that the, both the protein abundance of MTA and MTB remain unchanged in the HACAI mutants. And the further immunostaining uh, results show that the protein localization of MTA for HA or MTB for HA was not affected by mutations in HACAI. And um, Based on the data I've shown so far, it is clear that it, there is an extensive modulation among the M6A writers component at the protein level. So first is the regulation within the max subcomplex in which the MTM and MTB mutually affect each other's protein accumulation. Second is the modulation from the max sub, uh, MACOM subcomplex to the max subcomplex in, in which uh, FIP37 VRR, but not HICAI, uh, affect the um, protein accumulation of MTA and MTB. And third, I also found that uh, there is no obvious effect on the max subcomplex sub to the MACOM subcomplex. As uh, we can see here that the MT, uh, uh, as we can see from here that the FIP37 protein level remain unchanged in the MTB or MTA mutants. So the next question is whether there's a regulation with the MICOM subcomplex. The answer is yes. Uh, uh, FIP37 uh, protein level was greatly decreased in the VR knockdown mutants. So similar, re similar reduction was also found for the inflorescence signals of FIP37 GLP in the VR knockdown mutants. So, uh, However, the subcellular localization of uh, subcellular localization of 37 in the nuclear plasm is not affected by knockdown of VRR. And furthermore, I also compared the high cap protein abundance in the wild cap and the VRR knockdown mutants using a specific anti high cap antibody. A knockdown of VRR also strongly reduced the protein level of high cap. Mm, however, disruption of HICAI has no obvious effect on the protein abundance or localization of FIP37 protein. So in summary, uh, my results suggest a modulation network at the protein level underlying the functional interdependence of subunits in the M6A RETA complex. Uh, first, MTA and MTB mutually affect, mutually influence each other's protein accumulation, and MTA is also required for the nuclear localization of MTB. Secondly, uh, FIP37 stabilizes and affects the uh, affects the nuclear 
um, localization of MTA and MTB. And third, VNR is required for maintaining the normal protein abundance of MTA, MTB, FIB37, and HiKai. So interestingly, uh, this modulatory network is different from that in the mammalian cells in several ways. For example, uh, in mammalian cells, the WTAP, which is the ortholog of FIB37, is required for the nucleus speckle localization of metal 3 and metal 14. And the, and the VNR uh, promotes the WTAP protein accumulation, but it does not affect the protein abundance of metal 3 and metal 14. So uh, this result suggests that uh, although the um, plants and mammals, they share a conserved, conserved set of subunits in the M6 rather complex, plants has evolved a different regulatory mechanism to ensure the proper deposition of M6A, which is essential for the plant development and growth. So before concluding, con concluding I, would, I would like to thank my group members for discussion and suggestion on, the, on this work. And also I would like to thank the National Research Foundation and my institute, uh, Thomasic Lab Sciences, Lab Sciences Laboratory for the funding support. And thank you all for your attention. Yeah, really fantastic talk, Leisha. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to answer some questions. So just a reminder that you can submit your questions using the Q&A uh, button. We already have uh, one question submitted. Uh, Yashika Dingra asks, have you checked protein levels of FIP37 in the MTA mutant? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, I've checked the uh, FIB37 protein level in MTA mutant, but it, it is not uh, affected by, uh, by the um, MTA mutation. I think I have shown the result just now. Mm, yeah, it's here. Uh, so in the MTA um, knockdown lines, the protein level of FIB37 remain unchanged. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Uh, while we wait for a couple more questions to, to filter in, I can go ahead and ask a, a question in the meantime. Do you have any hypothesis on uh, how VIR or FIP37 is leading to the stabilization of uh, this, this complex? Mm, so currently, we don't have, uh, mm, we, we don't have experimental clues to for the mechanism, how these two proteins uh, affect the stability of uh, MTA and MTB. Uh, but indeed, in the, um, in the, in the mammalian cells, the, some reports have shown that this stabilization might involve, uh, in, in involve uh, other proteins involved in the protein degradation pathway. So we are ex exploiting these possibilities in plants. All right. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for answering uh, that question. Um, let me check to see if we have any new questions in the, the Q&A box. Um, I'll just give it one more. Oh, we just had one come in. Um, can you also comment on any physical interaction uh, among uh, among, I assume, the, the different uh, proteins in the complex. And this is also asked by Yashika Dingra, by the M6 writers, any physical interaction of the M6A oh, okay. uh, writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so um, uh, in, in, in vivo, for, I, I think we have performed the um, co-immunization as a mass spectral analysis. Uh, using the FIB37 MTA or MTB as a protein phage. Actually, we can find uh, all these, um, all the other members in the same complex. But how they are associated with each other, um, how, whether they are directly associated with each other in the complex, we, we still do not know. Yeah. All right. Great and fantastic talk again. I think just to keep on time, 
Uh, we are going to move on to the second talk, but we just had a couple more questions come in. So if you wanted to, you could take a look at the Q&A and you could uh, answer them uh, in the chat. But thank you again for such a great okay. talk. Thank you. Uh, fantastic thank you. job. I just got my screen sharing. Thank you. Mm. All right. And so now we'll move on to our uh, second speaker, Jeremy Bazin. Uh, and he is a researcher at the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment, and the Institute of Plant Sciences uh, in, in France. He was recruited to join Martine Crespi's team in 2021 and completed his PhD at Pierre and Marie Curie University, focusing on post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression controlling seed dormancy. He conducted postdoctoral work in the group of Julia Bailey Serres at the University of California, Riverside, on the function of non-coding RNAs in plant environmental responses. And today, Jeremy is interested in understanding the role of alternative RNA splicing in plant stress responses. He aims to understand the regulatory mechanisms that determine the specificity of alternative splicing and the contribution of this process to the evolutionary adaptation of plants to their environment, in particular in the context of climate change. So I'm really looking forward uh, to your, your talk, and I will go ahead and pass the screen over to you. Thank you, Nora, for the introduction, and thank you for having me here to present my, my work. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, Okay, so you see my screen, yeah. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, about a, a work we started a few years ago in collaboration with uh, Hervé Vaucheret in, uh, he was working, he's working in, uh, in RAD of Versailles here in France. And so it's about uh, the, the, the common role of two uh, splicing factors in the, actually in the control of uh, post-transcriptional gene silencing in plants. So post-transcriptional, uh, I mean, uh, RNA silencing or RNA interference is a very conserved mechanism that uh, allow to regulate gene expression and act also as a defense mechanism to uh, control either uh, endogenous sequences, such as uh, transposons, for instance, or also exogenous uh, transcripts, such as uh, transgenes or uh, viruses RNA. And so RNA requires the production of uh, double-stranded RNA that will be converted then into small interfering RNAs. And these small interfering RNAs can uh, mediate the repression of uh, gene expression, either at the transcriptional or the post-transcriptional level. So in the post-transcriptional uh, gene silencing, we talk about small RNA that regulates the, the messenger RNA at the post-transcriptional level. So one of the main questions in this, in this field is to understand why and how some loci that are not supposed to produce double-stranded RNA can trigger uh, PTGS, post-transcriptional gene silencing. And so, um, it is known that uh, uh, any uh, transcription events can lead to uh, the formation of aberrant RNAs. But these aberrant RNAs are normally uh, very tightly controlled by uh, a set of enzymes that are uh, collectively called the RNA quality control pathway. So they can degrade in, on both sides uh, aberrant RNAs. But if they escape this, this uh, quality control, this aberrant RNA are known also to be uh, uh, preferential substrates of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, such as RDR6 here, here in, the, in, in, uh, in, the, in the cytoplasm that produce uh, uh, double-stranded RNA. Uh, so, so the hypothesis is that this loci that, that, that undergo uh, PTGS such as, for instance, strongly expressed transgenes or, or viral RNA, are able to produce a, a high level of aberrant RNA that will saturate this machinery and, and, and will then trigger a PTGS of this, of this loci. And, and, and there are some experiments that support this hypothesis. For instance, uh, many of the mutants in these RQC pathways um, 
promote or, or enhance uh, PTGS of transgenes or uh, viral RNA. So following the, the, the conversion to double-stranded RNA, then, then you have loading, loading in AGO1, and AGO1 will trigger uh, the cleavage of uh, messenger RNA. And this process is then uh, can then be uh, okay, amplified because the, the cleavage product of the messenger RNA can then uh, trigger a secondary uh, production of double-stranded RNA, and you have a very strong amplification of this. And then can, this, this, this silencing can also propagate in, in neighboring cells. So over the years, the lab of uh, Ave Vosche has developed a set of uh, genetic screens to, um, to identify uh, the players involved in, in PTGS. So uh, the, the old ones is the classical co-suppression of the nitrate uh, reductase on them, the NIA2 genes, uh, where when you over try to overexpress this enzyme, you end up with plants that are mostly uh, uh, silenced. And so if you do, uh, EMS mutagenesis, then you can identify revertent of this phenotype. And, and another way is to transform plants with a 35 SGUS line. And when you do that, you end up with lines that uh, are, are trigger spontaneously uh, PTGS and that you can then mutagenesis to, to identify revertent. And so, so this kind of screen has allowed to identify many of the players in, in, in PTGS. Uh, including uh, uh, um, in, including key uh, regulators, but also recently uh, this kind of screen identify uh, um, splicing of, of proteins that are annotated as being uh, splicing factors or splice sosome components uh, to be involved in in in, uh, in PTGS. So a few years ago, we identify uh, a, pro a small uh, protein called SMD1. So SMD1 is a is a is a core component of the spliceosomal um, uh, U1, U2, and, and U4, and U5 SNRNP. So it's a key protein for the assembly of the spliceosome. So we found that this protein is expressed in the nucleoplasms, but uh, uh, mutation in, in, in MCMD1 can uh, um, suppress uh, PTGS. And we found that actually SMD1 bind to uh, the transgene uh, mRNA. And that's when you cross this uh, mutant with mutants involved in the RNA quality control pathway, you restore uh, the PTGS uh, in, in SMD1, meaning that this spliceosome component interplay between uh, splicing, RNA quality control, and uh, PTGS in plants. So yeah, this is just to summarize here, uh, we put here uh, SMD1 that binds to the transgene and is able to counteract the effect of uh, uh, RNA quality control to uh, uh, promote uh, gene silencing. Okay, so uh, recently we identify another component uh, of uh, the spliceosome that uh, is involved in, in, uh, in, in silencing in, in, in PTGS. So, it was a, 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 an allele that we call SGS15, and we found actually uh, two mutations. Um, so uh, that's uh, two. So one inversion of uh, 72, uh, sorry, 725 uh, kilobytes, uh, kilobase, and a deletion of 17 kilobases that included four genes. And we found that uh, both of these mutations included. Uh, PRP39 uh, gene. So the PRP39 gene is a, a component of the U1 SNRNP. So other uh, was a component of the spliceosome. And it was there was already a one report in Arabidopsis showing that uh, uh, it has a role in, uh, in in alternative splicing. So uh, uh, to answer uh, uh, the, that that the, the mutation was causal for 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 this gene was causal for the phenotype. We complemented this uh, uh, mutant line with the PRP39 uh, GFP and there is uh, under uh, ubiq ubiquitin promoter, and we could, could completely uh, uh, complement the phenotype. We found that, and it was already reported by uh, by another group, that it's actually a very uh, late flowing phenotype. And so, uh, then to further understand the role of PRP39 in PTGS, we we first checked the, 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 
the production of uh, siRNA of the nitrite reductase uh, in this line. And we found that actually in, uh, so you see the, this 2A3 line is the, the, the line we use for, 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 for the screen. You see a very strong production of small RNA uh, that is abolished in a classical HDS3 mutant. Uh, and in a PRP39 line, we, we, we also abolish the production of, of small RNA. So, so, so uh, PTGS is really affected in this line. But to further understand the role of uh, PRP39 in PTGS, we introduced this mutation in many other uh, silencing reporter. So uh, first we use uh, uh, intron-less engines that we classically use, but uh, with this line, we, we, we never recover this mutation. And what you see here is, uh, uh, so this line is a 35S with a GUS that is really strongly silenced. Uh, you see already at five days after germination, the, the activity of GUS is very low. So in a classical PTGS mutant, you would see uh, a total re uh, reactivation of uh, gas expression, so high gas activity. But in uh, when we introduce a PRP39 mutation in this line, we didn't see uh, any effect. So we thought that maybe is the fact that uh, only uh, intronic transcript can, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, intron containing transgenes can. Uh, attract uh, PAP39 uh, and therefore uh, uh, trigger PTGS. So we, we checked with another line, another GUS line that has a small influence uh, of, of a potato gene uh, that is inserted here. And, and with this line, we see that, uh, uh, we see a, a, a reduction of the GUS activity that is less strong than with the L1 uh, uh, line. But uh, we, we, we see uh, a reactivation of, uh, of the of suppression of the silencing in uh, the PRP39 uh, line, uh, yeah, in the, in the PRP39 mutant. So here there's two possibilities. Either uh, we really need an entrance in the transgene to attract PRP39, uh, or PRP39 is required only when the transgene is able to produce a uh, few aberrant RNA means in, in, in weak uh, uh, silencing inducer transgenes. So to discriminate between these two hypotheses, what we did is we use another line, uh, which is a weak uh, uh, PTGS line. So it's the same transgene as in the L1 line here, uh, but this, uh, uh, this line, in this line, we see only 20 to 25% of the plant that will trigger PTGS. So when we cross this line with uh, PRP39, uh, what we found is that there is no PTGS. So it means that uh, uh, the effect of PTGS on, on of, sorry, of PRP39 on PTGS is not specific to intron containing transgenes, but it depends more uh, on the strength of the silencing nucleus. So all these results show that uh, PRP39 is not a core component of PTGS but it seems to facilitate PTGS, especially in, on, on, on weak uh, transgenes. Weak. So then, uh, because many of the, of the mutants uh, involved in, 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 in PTGS affect globally uh, the production of small RNA, we checked uh, first by a series of northern blot on, on TASI RNAs and, and also uh, uh, microRNAs and some other uh, siRNAs. Uh, the, the, the level of the, this endogenous siRNA didn't change in, in, in two alleles of, of PAP39. Then we checked by uh, sequencing using a short stack to map de novo any cluster of small RNA. We found a very strong uh, correlation between the wild type and, and, and PAP39, suggesting that, that uh, Actually, PRP39 does not uh, affect globally uh, uh, small RNA biogenesis. Um, okay, then, then uh, we, because the, the PRP39 and the SMD1 mutants uh, were both recovered in the same screen and seem to have similar effect of PTGS, we perform RNA-seq in parallel uh, to check their effect uh, on alternative splicing, on, on and also pre-mRNA pre splicing in general, and their effect in, in RNA abundance. What we found is that, as expected, we found many uh, alternative splicing events that depends on these on this two 
um, genes, but the set of genes that were affected uh, in, in splicing are very different between these, these two uh, in these two mutants. And it was also the case for uh, genes that were differentially expressed that you can see here. And see, if we look then at the, the, the kind of genes that are differentially expressed, what we found is that uh, the genes that are uh, specifically upregulated in, in, in SMG1, they are, they are mostly linked to uh, plant immunity, whereas uh, the, the, the genes that are regulated in PRP, uh, upregulated in PRP39, they are mostly linked to, to, to development. So, so these two uh, proteins uh, affect splicing and abundance of a very distinct set of uh, endogenous transcripts. So we know that uh, RNA quality control uh, limits uh, PTGS by degrading uh, aberrant RNA that will initiate or, or induce uh, silencing. So the hypothesis is that, uh, well, that like uh, we found in SMD1, PRP39 would facilitate uh, PTGS by uh, limiting the degradation of uh, transgene derived uh, aberrant RNAs. So what we did is uh, that we crossed uh, the, the or, or, or silence line with a set of mutants. Uh, we crossed it to uh, uh, one uh, protein that is uh, involved in the nuclear exosome, HEN2, and one uh, also nuclear XRN, XRN3. So what we found is that already when we crossed this line, uh, with the two, these two mutants, we, we found that uh, there is, uh, um, we, we, we find that uh, the PTGS is already uh, is enhanced in this, these two lines. So this, you see here gas activity at different time points. You see that uh, when we cross it with R, this RQC mutant compared to the, to, the, to the wild type, we have a, a faster induction of PTGS, okay? So when we then introduce uh, PRP39 uh, in the in the the, the hen two uh, in in the in the hen two background, we fully uh, uh, recover the, the the wild type situation. Compare if you if you if you compare it to to uh, PRP39 only, we fully re recover the wild type situation. Uh, but when we do that with XRN3, we, 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 don't, we, we, we don't see the same effect. Uh, concerning SMG1, what we see is that uh, only uh, crossing with XRN3 is uh, able to completely uh, restore the, the wild type phenotype, suggesting that uh, PRP39 and SMG1 uh, interplay both with RQC, but with distinct uh, nuclear factor. Okay, okay, so, so the results presented uh, that I just presented uh, indicates that uh, um, PRP39 and SMD1 uh, limits uh, RQC uh, with different pathways. So we tested their, their genetic interaction using uh, two different transgenes. So the initial transgene that we use in the screen, NIA2, and we found here, so in NIA2, you have a full, uh, uh, in the wild type, you have uh, full uh, PTGS that you can see here. In, in PRP39 only, you have 60% of, uh, of silencing. In SMD1, uh, about 40%. When you cross the two lines, uh, you see a much stronger uh, inhibition of the silencing with uh, only 20% uh, of the lines that are silenced. We did that with another line, which is this uh, L1 line that uh, show a very strong uh, silencing effect and has no entrance. And you see that uh, when, you, when you introduce uh, PRP39 only, we see uh, uh, almost uh, no effect uh, on, the, on, on this line. SMD1 has only a minor effect on this line, but when you, uh, when, when you cross these two lines together, when you introduce PRP39, then in SMD1 mutants, you see an activation. So there is an additive effect of these two proteins in, in promoting uh, uh, PTGS. So then we checked uh, uh, the binding of uh, PRP39 to the GUS transgene, so using RNA-IP. 
uh, we use this GFP tagline. So uh, basically what we found is that uh, PRP39 does not bind to the transgene. So it binds to pre-messenger RNA that we identified as being differentially spliced, but doesn't bind to the GUS uh, uh, messenger RNA or the pre-messenger RNA. And it's, the, it's the completely the opposite for SMD1, where we have a very strong binding to the, to the transgene. So, okay, so we found that SMD1 binds to the transgene to prevent uh, degradation of the RQC, uh, but uh, PRP31 does not. So it somehow prevents uh, probably uh, aberrant RNA uh, degradation by N2. Uh, and so, uh, in, in an indirect way, probably. So we examined the accumulation of known uh, N2 targets in uh, PRP39 uh, mutants. And we found here uh, that uh, uh, actually half of the, of the N2 target that were uh, also found in the RNA-seq uh, uh, are down-regulated in, in, in PRP39. So uh, suggesting that in the absence of PRP39, these targets could, should be, could be more efficiently degraded than in, a, in the wild type plants. We check then uh, by more precisely these aberrant RNA uh, that are targeted by N2 in, in, in N2, in N2 PRP, PRP39 and in the, in the double mutants. Uh, what you see here, for instance, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, read through uh, uh, three prime extension that are detected in N2 that you see here accumulated in, in N2 in our condition. Uh, we're not strongly affected in the single mutant, but are, 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 are uh, not uh, accumulate much less in the PRP39 uh, N2. And, and we found that for, for, for a set of transcripts here, I, I put only four, but we have tested many more. And, and so it suggests that uh, PRP39 reduce uh, RNA degradation by, uh, by the nuclear endosome, exosome and particular by N2. So we conclusion, we propose a model in which these two proteins pro, uh, promote uh, um, um, PTGAs by uh, limiting uh, RQC mediated degradation of uh, aberrant RNA. Uh, by two distinct and, and complementary mechanisms. So SMD1 uh, binds to the transgene directly and, and, and probably limits uh, its degradation by uh, XRN3 and partly probably with the uh, exosome because we, have, we still have a, a genetic interaction. Uh, the effect on the effect of PRP39 is more speculative because we, it doesn't bind to the transgenes, uh, but we think it uh, uh, limits uh, uh, the action of the nuclear uh, exosome on, on this aberrant RNA. Uh, and, 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 and actually what supports this global hypothesis is that the double mutants uh, have, a, have a enhanced synergistic suppression of the PTGS. Okay, with that, I want to thank um, all the, the, the my, my lab members here and in IPS2 in particular, uh, Martin Crespi, and all the collaborators uh, in, in Hervé Vosche lab in uh, IGPB here in, uh, in Versailles. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you for such a, a great talk. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, the Q&A session. Just take a couple minutes to answer your questions. Just a reminder that you can submit questions to the speaker using the Q&A button. Uh, we already have a couple questions submitted here. Uh, Will Prout asks, is there a difference between SMD1B and other SM proteins? And do you think SMD1B functions as part of the SMD ring complex or as an individual protein? No, actually, uh, yes, these proteins are very conserved. And in the SMD1, uh, you have two paradoxes in Arabidopsis. And actually, when we, we never recovered the, the, the double mutant, so, so it really suggests that these, these are our core proteins that are essential for the spliceosome. And usually, core protein of the spliceosome, they are uh, 
they are little, mutants are little. So yes, yes, we think it has probably a dual role, uh, but it's clearly involved in the SMD ring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, for answering that question. Uh, I was also wondering, does the three prime end of the RNA uh, influence the action of these, these proteins at all, like the polyadenylation status? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a good question. Actually, uh, what is known and something we, we, we didn't check yet, but it's known that PRP39 uh, in, 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 in yeast, it's involved in the formation of the three prime end. It's controlling the, 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 the three prime end, uh, the actually determination of transcription also. So we think it could be linked, uh, it could have uh, such a role, but we couldn't detect it in the RNA seq because we are using mature RNA. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for answering that. I think to stay on time, uh, we're going to move on to the next talk, but thank you very much for that fantastic talk. And if there are additional questions, um, maybe you can keep an eye on the, the chat and answer them through the, the Q&A box. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move on uh, to our, our final speaker. So Vinay Najarajan is a scientist at Syngenta, North Carolina. Vinay earned his uh, PhD from Purdue University, uh, Indiana, under the direction of K.G. Rakothama in the Department of Horticulture. He joined the lab of Pamela Green at the University of Delaware, initially as a postdoctoral researcher, then continuing as an associate research scientist. His research focused on the characterization of eukaryotic ribonucleases uh, involved in mRNA turnover by globally capturing ribonuclease substrates using RNA degradome uh, approaches. So Vinay, I'm really looking forward uh, to your, your talk. I'll, I'll pass the screen to you. Thank you, Nora, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. So um, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for this opportunity for presenting, allowing to present this work, uh, what I did in Pam Green's lab. And uh, this is a story I would like to share with you on how we identified DNA1, uh, substrates of DNA1 endoribonuclease in Arabidopsis, and how this takes us one step closer to understanding the molecular mechanism of DNA1 mediated decay in plants. So um, I would like to start off with a short introduction to cytoplasmic mRNA decay. Uh, mRNA decay in the cytoplasm is crucial for establishing post-transcriptional control of gene expression. And there are uh, several decay factors like endoribonucleases and exoribonucleases that play a role in RNA turnover. So let's start with the uh, mRNA that can undergo deannulation uh, de and also decapping, where the cap complex, a uh, decapping complex removes the uh, five prime cap. And this leads to a five prime monophosphate on the mRNA that is a preferred substrate of this large uh, cytoplasmic five prime to three prime exoribonuclease called XRN4. This is different from what Jeremy had presented XRN3, that is a nuclear uh, exoribonuclease. But XRN4 is a major cytoplasmic exoribonuclease. Uh, the other mechanism that is relevant to the stock is the one mediated by endoribonucleases. So endoribonucleases cleave mRNA, resulting in unprotected five prime and three prime fragments. And these are turned over by uh, the RNA exosome from three prime to five prime and, and also uh, XRN4, which degrades from five prime to three prime. Endoribonucleases are integral to RNA processing and decay across all kingdoms of life. The focus here uh, is mostly on the uh, cytoplasmic mRNA uh, and endo endoribonucleases that decay mRNA, uh, such as SMUG6. That's an example that's uh, uh, an endoribonuclease that cleaves NMD substrates in metazoans. Uh, PAM's lab uh, some years ago identified uh, helped identify the substrates of SMUG6 in human um, human cells. Uh, but uh, SMUG6 is one of the few endoribonucleases for which global substrates are mapped. But in general, even for well-known endoribonucleases, uh, substrates have not been identified. So 
RNA degradome analysis provides a snapshot for capturing RNA decay intermediates at a given time. It's ideally suited for capturing uh, monophosphorylated RNA, such as those that are produced by endoribonuclease mediated cleavage, and also decapping. The two most commonly used approaches uh, for capturing uh, five prime monophosphorylated RNA are PAIR and GMUCT. PAIR was developed in PAMS lab a long time ago. And uh, in, in, in principle, both these techniques are very similar, where they capture uh, uh, five prime monophosphate by an RNA adapter ligation, reverse transcribed, and then the double stranded DNA is sequenced through high throughput sequencing. A couple of years ago, I had uh, taken the step to uh, study XRN4 substrate because XRN4 being a major five prime to three prime exoribonuclease, uh, identifying its substrate would also help us understand the substrates of decapping as well as other endoribonuclease uh, cleaved products. So we had generated uh, libraries, degradome libraries from file type and the XRN4 loss of function mutant to identify the substrates of XRN4 enzyme. Uh, we had identified several uh, almost 500 odd transcripts with a, a three prime fragment uh, corresponding to um, a cleaved product. We visualize degradome data by looking at uh, these so-called D plots or decay plots. So here are two examples. So POW2 and ERF1-1. On the um, y-axis is normalized abundance of the five prime monophosphate signal. And this is Columbia and this is XRN4 mutant. So as you can see, this arrow indicates the site where this is the most abundant five prime monophosphate sequence on the transcript. On the y-axis is the coordinates of the transcript. So for power two, this is a strong signal that we can detect in an XRN4 mutant. And in Columbia, it's uh, highly reduced. So this product actually can be captured on a northern blot, uh, on a northern blot as uh, if you place a probe downstream of the uh, this product called MaxSeq, the most abundant pair uh, sequence, a degradome sequence, we can actually ca detect this three prime fragment. Same as the case with ERF1, uh, this is the most abundant uh, sequence on the uh, three prime UTR. And again, if you place a probe, this uh, you can actually detect the three prime fragment. So basically this three prime fragment corresponds to this max seek that's seen in uh, XRN4. So what is intriguing with this result is that POW2 and ERF1-1 are NMD sensitive transcripts. Both of them, both these genes, uh, their levels are elevated in NMD mutants. And also, they, they have features that can trigger nonsense mediated decay. So, for instance, POW2 has a five prime upstream open reading frame, and ERF1 has a long three prime UTR and also an intron in the three prime UTR. Again, features that can trigger uh, nonsense mediated decay. But what is intriguing with this result is also the fact that uh, SMUG6 that targets nonsense mediated decay sensitive transcripts in metazoans is actually absent in plants. So this opened up a whole new um, investigation for us to figure out what is cleaving transcripts like POW2 and ERF1-1. While we were figuring this out and we had written a grant to NSF to identify endorabonucleases that um, cleave mRNA in Arabidopsis, um, there was a study where an endorabonuclease was identified as an interacting partner of UPF1, the major NMD effector. And this was from uh, Damien Garcia's group. So this endoribonuclease is also a homolog of metazoan MARF1. Metazoan MARF1 has nothing to do with nonsense mediated decay. So just uh, an FYI here. Uh, and this endoribonuclease also was found more recently to interact with uh, DCP1, the decap one of the decapping cofactors. And that's why it is named DNE1, which stands for DCP1 associated NY and endoribonuclease. So this endoribonuclease has an NYN domain in the N terminus. And aligning the N the N NYN domain of DNE1 with human and mouse MARF1, um, you can see that uh, these triangles indicate the four catalytic aspartic acid residues that is required for uh, catalysis. And these four were identified uh, based on a study that was done in mouse MARF1 
where they identified these sites to be essential for cleavage. And uh, the one here in pink uh, is one of the sites we had used to look at uh, uh, the enzyme activity in planta. So we next examined the expression of DNA1 in Arabidopsis. Uh, we also looked at uh, localization of the tagged CFP tagged DNA1. So Arabid uh, Arabidopsis DNA1 is ubiquitously expressed. Uh, localization was uh, what was interesting for us was to see uh, that it localized to the cytoplasm in distinct foci. And this was independently verified uh, considering that DNA1 co-localization was also shown to be in P bodies uh, and associated with DCP1 in the study by Damien Garcia's group. So we independently verified this result uh, in our, at our own end. So in transgenic Arabidopsis, uh, DNA1 localizes to distinct foci in the cytoplasm. So going back to our question of whether DNA1 will be is generating these three prime fragments we had seen. So we introduced the DNA1 loss of function mutation in an XRN4 mutant background. And the first thing was to do this RNA uh, northern blot analysis. And here is uh, POW2, uh, this is the full length transcript, and the three prime fragment that's produced in XRN4 disappeared in the DNA1 XRN4 uh, double mutant. And we were so thrilled by this result. And we, we thought, okay, yeah, we have a, we have a excellent candidate that would cleave NMD uh, substrates in the Arabidopsis. However, when we looked at ERF1, that wasn't the case where ERF1 still produced the three prime fragment uh, compared to XRN4. So maybe ERF1 could be cleaved by unknown endoribonucleases. However, the three prime fragment of POW2 is definitely dependent on DNA1 DNA activity. So with this result, we proceeded to the next step of looking at uh, the global analysis of uh, decay substrates. So we compared uh, XRN4 DNA1 and Columbia uh, using GMUCT, which is similar to PAIR, as I had mentioned, in capturing uh, these five prime decay intermediates. So I'm not going to go through this computational pipeline, but in gist of it is the way we compared was we, uh, uh, our way of looking at it was a cleaved site that's within a DNA1 target transcript will be present in an XRN4 because DNA1 is still active. However, in the DNA1 XRN4 double, this site should disappear because the enzyme generating that site is not there. So using this computational pipeline, we identified about 224 sites in 224 transcripts. And uh, what we saw in general was uh, the DNA1 target sites occurred in exons uh, within the CDS. Of course, we wanted to go back to POW2 to see if we can capture this result. So again, the, the decay plot with uh, uh, normalized abundance uh, across Columbia, XRN4 and DNA1 XRN4 and uh, position on the coordinates on the transcript. As you can see, the max seq pertains to XRN4 and it's virtually absent in DNA1 XRN4 uh, to, to indicate that yes, uh, POW2 three prime fragment is dependent on DNA1 activity. We looked at ERF1, of course, there is no difference. Uh, it's comparable, it's a little higher in the DNA1 XRN4 background. So definitely DNA1 does not in, uh, interfere with, uh, sorry, does not produce a three prime fragment for ERF1. We looked at additional candidates too. So here is ATHB6 and there is RCC1. We characterize RCC1 in a little bit more detail. Again, you have a maxi, uh, highly strong signal uh, present in XRN4 uh, and absent in the DNA1 XRN4. We can look at the northern blot with the three prime probe downstream of the maxi. Uh, the cleavage site, and you can see that it's present in XRN4 and absent in the double mutant. So the next question we had was to see if there is, uh, the, uh, what is the um, uh, contribution of the NYN domain to the production of this fragment? So this is POW2 again. So we introduced the cDNA copy of DNA1, the wild type copy into transgenic uh, in plants, and these are transgenic T3 lines where you can see when you add back POW2, you can detect the fragment back in the uh, DNA1 XRN4. So that complements. 
But if you make the point mutation at the catalytic site, uh, the active site, it the fragment fails to be produced, indicating that this particular site is responsible for generating the three prime fragment. Again, we did the same thing for uh, RCC1, uh, the wild type version brings back the three prime fragment and the point mutation doesn't. So indicating that DNA1 is an active endoribonuclease that cleaves power to an RCC1 and also other mRNAs. The next question was back to the what we very started, our NMD targets among uh, DNA1 uh, substrates. So first thing was to look at the upstream open reading frame because we saw POW2 was one of the candidates. So we checked other upstream open reading frames, transcripts with upstream open reading frames. And of course, there is an enrichment. Uh, the way this was compared is we have targets and the non-targets uh, where mostly uh, transcripts that have a highly abundant um, max seq, but there is no difference between XRN4 and DNA1 XRN4. So they accumulate to the same level. And the non-targets, the other set of controls where the XRN4 insensitive ones where the the, uh, the sites, five prime uh, monophosphate sites were comparable between Columbia and XRN4. So compared to the controls, uh, when we looked at UPF1 data sets from published papers uh, where gene expression studies were carried out on UPF mutants. We didn't find much of an enrichment among uh, NMD targets and uh, DNE1 targets. So this was quite, quite a surprising result, uh, but uh, the bottom line is that most NMD sensitive transcripts are not DNE1 targets. Although you do have some cases where there is a DNE1 dependent uh, uh, target. Uh, we also looked at uh, to see if there is a sequence specificity involved with DNA1. So we looked at uh, the uh, cleavage site and the surrounding sequence, and we found a degenerate G-rich sequence within 10 nucleotides of the cleavage site, indicating that there is some form of sequence uh, uh, preference of DNA1. Our next finding was uh, to compare RNA half-lives so based on the uh, data set from Leslie Siebert's group, which was global RNA half-life measurements, we compared the half-lives of uh, targets, non-targets, and XRN4 sensitive transcripts. In, sorry, XRN4 insensitive transcripts. And what was surprising to us was that the median half-life of targets, uh, DNA1 targets, was less than 60 minutes, twice uh, are getting turned over twice as fast as non-targets clearly indicating that DNA1 targets tend to be unstable. While conducting this analysis, um, I noticed that uh, uh, the degradome data, of course, gives you information on abundance of decapped intermediates. So while looking at a lot of d-plots in my data set, one thing I was seeing was a trend where the decapped abundance of uh, targets was higher in DNA one XRN4 compared to XRN4. So I also looked at other targets that include um, other uh, XRN4 sensitive transcripts that are decapped because XRN4 also turns over decapped messages. So what was intriguing here was that in general, irrespective of whether DNA one it's a DNA one target or not, uh, DNA one seems to impact uh, the abundance of decapped messages. Um, at much to a much higher extent than XRN4 itself. So this indicated that there's an additive effect of DNA1 mutation uh, in an XRN4 background. And we uh, 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 suggest in our work that uh, DNA1 could also function as a decapping effector. There is evidence to indicate that DNA1 has a role in mRNA decapping based on uh, this work from Damien Garcia's lab, where they showed that uh, DNA1 physically interacts with DCP1 and also a large number of uh, transcripts uh, overlap between decapping mutants, um, the elevated and decapping mutants, as well as the DNA1 uh, uh, mutant version. So therefore, the, uh, there's evidence to indicate that DNA1 has an additive effect on decapping and could be promoting decapping. So with this, I propose a model where there's a dual role for DNA1 where in addition to its role as an endoribonuclease to cleave um, unstable transcripts or tra transcripts with uh, this 
G-rich degenerate sequence. But in addition to that, the association of DP, uh, DNA1 to uh, the decapping complex uh, promotes uh, decapping. It's another way of uh, impacting gene expression. So just to summarize this result, uh, we identified over 200 DNA1 dependent sites using the GMUCT analysis. This is also a plant's first paper because uh, DNA1 is the first Marfan family member across all eukaryotes for which endogenous targets were mapped using the degradome approach. Yay for plants. Um, and the other thing, uh, other finding is that uh, DNA1 is an active endoribonuclease and its targets are uh, unstable, but they are not NMD sensitive in general, mostly not NMD sensitive. And uh, we, have, we postulate a model where uh, DNA1 can enhance the capping rate in addition to its role as an endoribonuclease. So with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, Pam Green for her constant guidance and support. Catherine Stewart, uh, who was a master's student back then, and Anna Di Batista, who was an undergraduate student during this work. Uh, they did tremendous work for this, uh, this study. And of course, uh, all the excellent technical help from Monica Cherby and the fantastic uh, localization images, thanks to Jeff Kaplan. Thank you, I would like to take questions now. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, really interesting work. We'll go ahead and move over to the Q&A session. Just another reminder, uh, you can go ahead and submit those questions using the Q&A button uh, so that the speaker can answer them. We already have a couple questions here for you. The first one is from Yashika Dingra. So uh, they ask, please comment how DNA1 is differentiating uh, between indirect and direct targets when it is interacting with similar proteins in both targets. Just going back to the model, um, one thing we would see is for DNA1, the, the interaction is that it cleaves the mRNA, right? So we don't know how it changes this whole um, complex because it is known that DCB1 does associate to DNA1, but based on the... Um, a paper from Damien Garcia's group, it's not, so they propose that there are these subcomplexes where DCP1 associates with DNA1, but not all the time. So the endoribonuclease function could be independent of uh, DCP1 interaction, but it also could be part of the complex. So it's, with mRNA decay, there's a constant, uh, there's, there's competition on who gets to it first. Uh, and my uh, thoughts with this is that uh, there is the decapping working in addition to the endoribonuclease. That's uh, activity at the same time that can also happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, great answer. I think we'll wrap up with just one uh, last question for today from Marin Arling. Uh, so they say, great talk. Can you comment on any pattern in the direct targets that you see? Like, are they all transcription factors or involved in specific biological? Uh, activities? Um, the the upstream open reading frame, the transcripts of that, those were the most common ones. But there were a lot of, uh, so there were some categories that were, um, trying to remember. Uh, so there are a couple of clock genes that were interesting, um, that are also targeting, uh, be targeted by uh, endoribonuclease, uh, DNA1. And, uh, but in general, DNA1's role appear to be, appears to be just like cleave transcripts that are unstable. So there was no set um, go categories that were enriched. Uh, there are very sub very small subset, but the ones, as I said, there are some clock genes in there and also some upstream open reading frame transcripts. But yeah, it seems to be a general mRNA decay process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So thank you for answering those questions. Uh, I think I'm going to pass it back over um, but thank you for everyone for attending the, the webinar. And I, I really enjoyed moderating for you all today. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Um, speakers, fantastic. Becky, wonderful to see you. Thank you for doing this. And um, really check out the focus issue. It's on the Plant Cell website. And um, again, look at our YouTube channel for this recording and the previous one. And next month, we'll be featuring uh, plant physiology, looking at 
fruit crops. So something almost completely different. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for the fantastic talks. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.